let's see this is lecture 2 and it's okay lecture 2 of error control codes there you go good start okay so so let me again once again uh, refresh us to where we were we were looking at a linear encoder and what did we say a linear encoder would do would take a message m and multiply with a matrix g on the right to get a code word c okay okay something very nasty has happened and all kinds of things are changing but anyway it's okay i think i should rotate it like this no once more once more is that fine okay so what are these different quantities this quantity m is a k bit vector right <coughs> and this is going to be a k by n matrix and this is going to be a n bit vector okay so you actually want to send the message m and to get, give it some protection from errors etc you're going to add some redundancy of n minus k bits which is the parity bits and i enforce the constraint that each parity bit should be a linear combination binary xor of some chosen subset of the message bits so based on that we got this simple simple uh, situation okay so this is the first uh, view of what actually happens in a linear encoder trying to generalize it a little bit can one of you go over there and tell those guys there's a class going on and move them a little bit outside thank you <coughs> so so this is this was the generator matrix view okay so this is very important and this will nicely generalize as i briefly mentioned to the basis for a subspace which the code will actually be okay once again remember the crucial definition was the code what is the code code was the list of all code words distinct from the encoder which is a mapping from the message to the code word. okay so that was uh, that's one more fact which i mentioned last time. okay there's also what's called a parity check view okay which is very interesting Uh, parity check view okay so again i'll introduce this with the example and then we'll once again look at it as a matrix and we'll see how that works out always okay so in the example i had what were my three encoding equations i had p0 equals m0 plus m1 i had p1 equals m1 plus m2 and i had p2 equals m0 plus m2 right these were my three equations okay so i'm going to play around with these equations a little bit and interpret them as checks that every code word has to satisfy to belong to the code okay so here what have i done given a message i'm generating a code word from the code now i want to do something else which is closer to the receiving side suppose somebody gives me an arbitrary n bit vector i want to be able to tell whether it's a code word or not okay so what so how do i go about doing it for that you can again manipulate with, with the same equations and get those checks okay what do i do i, I simply move all the things that are on the right hand side to the left hand side i'll get constraints that bits in the code word have to satisfy which are called parity checks okay so let me move these things around so i'm going to move m0 and m1 to the left hand side so what what will what will it be p0 plus, plus m0 plus m1 why because everything is modulo 2 right so i don't have to worry about uh, anything else about any minus ones that might show up okay so p0 plus m0 plus m1 equals 0 p1 plus m1 plus m2 equals 0 bear with me if you've already seen what what the exact thing should be but i want to write it down just to drive home the point that these two are completely equivalent if you do any encoding according to the three equations that you see on your left okay and if you enforce the parity check constraints that you see on the right you will get the same set of code words <coughs> okay so do you understand what i mean okay suppose i give you a 3 bit message and find the 6 bit code word according to the equations on the left that you see here okay i'll get a list of code words suppose i go through the list of all 6 bit vectors and only pick those vectors which satisfy the three equations on the right i'll get another list of code words these two lists will be exactly identical Okay, this will follow very readily if you look at it very closely. You don't have to worry too much about it. Okay, now these equations, see, we wrote the equations on the left in the generator matrix form, right? We're going to write the equations on the right also in a matrix form, and that will be called the parity check matrix. Okay, so how do I write that now? I want a matrix H. Okay, <coughs> what's the parity check matrix now?
okay i'll call it h it's always called h in most places h okay it satisfies this requirement h times c transpose equals 0 for all code words c okay so that is the matrix so i want a matrix h and h times c transpose should satisfy that property it should be should vanish right h times c transpose should be zero for all code words c okay so 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 i have to say one more thing to actually fully define that it should also say that h times c transpose should not be zero if c is not a code word okay I'm, I'm not explicitly written that down, but it's okay. I mean, it's clear enough from the way I've written it down. If it becomes zero, for instance, if I pick H, H to be the all zero matrix, it's going to be zero always. I mean, it's not it's no, no good to you as a parity check matrix. You want it to be zero only if it is a code word. If it's not a code word, it should not be zero. <coughs> okay, so it should clearly say that. That's built into it. I'm not writing it down explicitly. Okay, that's the first thing. The other thing is, what can you say? What, what more can you say about H now? H should have how many columns? Well, I, I don't know anything about the rows. I've not said anything about the rows, but only thing I can figure out just because I'm able to multiply with C transpose on the right, what should it mean? It should have definitely n columns. That's the only thing I can say. Can't say anything about the rows. We'll come to it soon enough. Okay, but it should have n columns. Okay, that's, that's pretty much the only thing you can say. Okay, so I want a matrix of this form. Okay, should hide this. Okay, so I have a matrix of this form. Okay, so for this example that we had, let's try to cook up that matrix. It's very easy. In the example, okay, okay, okay. Ah, there you go. All right. So in the example, it's very easy to cook up that matrix, right? So I want some matrix on the left which will multiply my code word. What was my code word? M0, M1, M2. Remember, I have to transpose it. P0, P1, P2. And I should get, where did I put a bar below the 0? Okay, So I'm expecting this to be a vector, right? What will, what will be the length of that vector? Number of rows of H. Okay, So it's very easy to see all those things. So I want, I'll put three zeros on the right because I know I'll get only three equations okay so you can actually get more okay but right now we'll work with these three equations okay all right so what does the first equation tell me p0 plus m0 plus m1 has to be 0 okay so i can put ones here very easily 1 1 0 1 0 0 is that fine <coughs> okay what about the second equation it says m m1 plus m2 plus P1 equals 0. Okay, so go back and write that down. 0, 1, 0. All right. Now, what does the third equation tell me? M0 plus M2 plus P2 equals 0. And I can write that down really easily as 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so there you go. I formed a matrix H. Can I add one more row now if I want to? Suppose I want to add one more row. Can I add one more row? Yes so or no? Let me see. How many of you say no? Okay. How many of you say yes? Yeah. Actually, you can add. I mean, you can add so many more. Okay. They'll not be independent. That's another point. I don't care if it's independent or not. Okay. You can add one more row. What? What can I add? I can do. Yeah. All zero. <laughs> okay. Don't don't give me very trivial answers. I can even add non-trivial rows. Right? What What are the non-trivial rows I can add? Any linear combination of these three rows can be added, and you'll still get another parity check matrix. Not. It won't be the most reduced form, but you can take linear combinations, right? Because I know that side is satisfied, this check is satisfied. Take any linear combination, again, it's going to be satisfied. It's no problem, okay? So I could take a linear combination, but this, this three have a special property, okay? They are linearly independent and they fully define the checks, okay? That will come to soon enough, okay? But this is the parity check matrix for the code, for the example code, okay? Now, it's not clear if this is readily possible in the general case also. Okay, well, it's, well, it's, it's quite clear that it's possible in the general case, right? If you have a, if you have any generator matrix, right? What does the generator matrix tell you? It tells you how to write 
each parity check as a combination of several message bits. You can always move it to the other side and then convert it back into equations. For each parity, you will get one equation. You should be able to do it. Okay, but it's nevertheless easy to have good if you have a general formula for how to go from G to H. Okay, so it's good to have that. Once you have that, you don't have to write all these equations out and move things from one side to the other. Maybe you lose something when you move, right? So let's not let's not do all that. So the general formula is also very very simple. Okay, if so in general. If you have a generator matrix of the form i, okay, I'll put a k here to qualify the what, what am I saying? The size, okay. When I say i k, it is a k by k identity matrix, and then p, okay. What's the size of p? K by, k by n minus k, okay. So that's clear. The parity check matrix you will see if you write down the equations and do the moving around will turn out to be p transpose i n minus k. It's clear it should be n minus k, right? Why should you have n minus k? k. You will have one equation per one equation per parity that you generate, right? See, each equation I got was for one parity. For every equation, I can move things to the other side and then write one equation. Okay? So for every parity, you will get an equation. So you will, in following that procedure, you will get n minus k equations. Okay? That's the, that's the important part. So you can always do this. Okay? So that's what uh, is important. All right, so now we know for any linear encoder that one comes up with in the systematic form, it's easy to go from generator matrix to parity check matrix. Okay, so all this is very, I mean, a lingo very close to coding theory. People think of generator matrix, parity check matrix, the rows of the generator matrix have some significance, which we'll see soon enough, but that's how the lingo goes. Okay, now what we'll do next is to interpret all this using the language of vector spaces. Okay, which will give us a very nice generalization. At the same time, you will get a deeper understanding, hopefully, using your knowledge of vector spaces as to what these matrices are and how, and what way should you think about them. Okay, so that's what we'll do next. So that's the vector space view. Yes. Yeah. That's true. So the question was the number of independent rows in H will actually be equal to the number of parities that you generated. Yeah, it will be. The number of independent rows in the generator matrix will be equal to what? Number of message bits that you have. That's also true. Okay, so the vector space view. So first first thing we'll do is define the binary vector space. So quite simple to see. So the set 0, 1, n, okay, is actually a n-dimensional vector space okay is that a good thing to say if i say just n dimensional vector space does it mean anything what else should i say over what field okay it's very important right the vector space doesn't exist by itself it's over some field okay so i have to say what field it is okay over the, there are several fields over which it will not be a vector space okay it's over it's a vector space over what's called the binary field okay we will see that for now, over this field 0, 1. Okay, so what is a field now? A field is something where you can do addition, multiplication, division, and all that. Okay, so it's very clear if you have just two elements 0 and 1 that you can add and multiply and divide and subtract, do everything you want as long as you do it modulo 2. Okay, as long as you do everything modulo 2, you can do all those things. So 0, 1 actually becomes a field, and this 0, 1, n is actually an n dimensional vector space over. 0, 1. Okay, so I will not labor the point too much here. Okay, but if you don't understand it too much, <coughs> very, if you don't understand the theoretical details uh, a great deal, practically what's important is once you have a vector space, what is it that you can do? You can add two vectors, and what should you get? You should definitely get another vector in the same space. Can you add two n bit vectors? Yeah, just simply XOR bitwise. Okay, so that's the important thing. So the addition in this vector space is bitwise XOR or another way to think about it is each bit is added to the corresponding bit in the next vector modulo 2. You just do the regular addition but you reduce it mod 2. That's the way to think about it. So another operation that's important in the vector space is what? 
<coughs> scalar multiplication. What are the scalars? The field gives you the set of scalars. Here the scalar multiplication is extremely trivial. Why? You either multiply by 0 or 1. Okay, what, what will happen if you multiply by 0? You will get the all 0 vector. What will happen if you multiply by 1? You will get the same thing. Okay, so I am sorry, is that a question? Okay, so there is no real problem with this scalar multiplication. In fact, if you use more technical language, any group, any abelian group will be a vector space over 0, 1 because addition is the only thing that matters, right? So, multiplication is quite trivial, does, it comes for free. Okay, so scalar multiplication is very trivial. I won't write down that very clearly. I'll simply say trivial scalar multiplication. Okay, so so what's the good basis for this vector space? You can take the canonical basis. How will you take canonical basis? 1 followed by all 0, 0, 1 followed by 0, 0, 0, 1 followed by 0. That is a good basis. Can there be any other basis? Yeah, you can have any number of, can you have any number of bases? It cannot be infinite. It will be finite, right? The vector space itself is finite. There are only 2 power n vectors. So, who can count the total number of different bases that you will get? Okay, can you count? Okay, if you cannot count, that is a good problem to work on. Okay, it is a nice counting. It is not very difficult to count, but still. If you have not thought about it, there is only a finite number of bases and it is possible to count it also. Okay? So, that is <coughs> that's, that's some word about the basis. Okay? So, we will usually pick the canonical basis if we have uh, any confusion. Okay? So, you can have a basis. Okay? That is the next thing I want to write down. So, the basis we will typically choose will be the canonical basis. There is no problem with that. You can choose that. Okay, what else is interesting in a vector space? What else would you like? Okay, you would like subspaces, right? Subspaces are definitely interesting. So yeah, this is a finite dimensional vector space. So obviously, it has a subspace. How would you define subspaces? How would you go about generating subspaces for a vector space? The best way of doing it is just start with the basis for the subspaces. Provide any basis. Okay, if you want n dimension, you know the subspaces should have dimensions less than or equal to n. Okay, simply provide basis vectors. Okay, suppose <coughs> suppose I give you m basis vectors. Okay, then you know all linear combinations of those m basis vectors would belong to the subspace generated by that. Okay, all this is very standard. I'm going through very fast, but I hope this is very this is a very basic review for you. I don't have to go through a great detail. Okay, there's one thing you have to be careful about when you define subspaces. You can define subspaces in the most easiest way is to provide what is called a spanning set, right? Just provide a set of vectors and say the span of this set of vectors is my subspace. What is the basis for the subspace? It is an independent spanning set. So, from the spanning set, you have to throw away the dependent vectors and get your basis. And the dimension of the subspace is the number of vectors you get that way in your basis, okay? That is the way you think about subspaces, okay? So, subspaces are fine. You can define them using... define using basis. Okay. So, the next thing which is most interesting in most vector spaces is a inner product. Okay. So, the inner product makes a real difference in the way you understand it. right? So, suppose you think of R3. right? R3 is a nice vector space. When you think of defining a subspace, what are the two dimensional subspaces of R3? Uh, the planes that the pl that pass through the origin. Okay, the planes have to pass through the origin. Otherwise, it's not a subspace, right? Right? Okay, good. Right, so it's not a subspace if it doesn't pass through the origin. Okay, that's so. How do you define a plane that passes through the origin? There are two ways of defining it. What are the two ways that you have learnt in defining such planes? One is to provide two linearly independent vectors on the plane. What's another way? The normal. Okay, so, what, what, how did you get the normal? Normal came from the definition of the inner product. You know, the normal is going to be orthogonal to all the vectors on the plane. Okay, so, the inner product plays a very good role in, in your understanding of what these subspaces are. Instead of saying what lies on the subspace, you say what is orthogonal to the subspace and that gives you a lot of information about what the subspace is, right, even though you are defining the orthogonal part. So, the inner product is very important and even in this binary vector space, 
there is an inner product which behaves very differently from your regular inner product in Rn. Okay, in in the real vector space, there are some very interesting properties that this has, which makes it, which makes the binary vector space different from Rn, for instance. Okay, so let's define the inner product. Okay, I'll take x dot y. This will be my notation. Sometimes I'll use the, sometimes I might use this notation also in case the dot is a little bit ambiguous. I might use this notation. Okay, what is the definition here? x1, y1 plus x2, y2 plus so on till xn, yn. But what? What is my plus? Modulo, Modulo 2. Okay, why? The inner product is always defined to take you from two vectors to what? To the field of scalars. Okay, you can't go anywhere you want, right? To the inner product. Okay, so you have to reduce it modulo 2, and that modulo 2 makes all the difference you need between the Rn and 0, 1 n. Okay, it makes makes a big difference. Okay, this is the inner product. All right, so the inner product seems simple enough. So hopefully all the intuition you have about from the inner product in Rn should help you a little bit. Many of the results are true, but there's one result which is starkingly different in the binary case. Okay, so I'll highlight what is different. Okay, this is this is the difference. Okay, difference from Rn is what? In Rn, if x dot x is zero, implies what? X is zero. Implies x is zero. Here, it does not imply that x is zero. Okay, why? Because you did. Modulo 2, it is very easy to come up with examples of, of, of a non-zero vector which when taken a dot product with itself will give you 0. Okay, What is a good example? 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. In fact, you can characterize all the non-zero vectors which will give you a dot product with itself as being 0. What would you characterize that? Even, even number of 1s. You take any vector with the even number of 1s one, in it, then if you take a dot product with itself, you will definitely get? 0. <coughs> okay, So, there are several of them. Exactly how many even numbered will be there in 0, 1, n? Oh my god, I thought this was a very simple question. So, how many even numbered vectors will be there in the set of all n bit vectors? Half, right? Does it make sense that it should be half? Okay, Convince yourself that it should be half. You will have 2 power n minus 1 even number, 2 power n minus 1 odd number. Okay, good. So, that is the <coughs> that is the inner product. Okay, So, even though this is not true, okay, you, the subspaces, for subspaces you can have dual spaces. Okay, that, that All that will still hold. Okay, So, you, you, you can go back and look at your proofs of dual spaces in vector space theory if you want very closely and convince yourself that for even though this is not true, you can always define a dual space for a given subspace. Okay, Suppose I have, so let me define that. Suppose I say S is a m dimensional subspace of subspace of 0, 1, n. Okay. What does that mean? In if you want to be very specific about it, S should have a basis with how many independent vectors in it? M independent vectors in it. That is what specifically it means. For that subspace, I can define a dual. So, I will call S perp, okay, that is how you read that, S with a perpendicular sign on top, S perp. Okay. This will be the set of all vectors x in 0, 1, n such that, okay, x in 0, 1, n such that, what? x dot y is 0 for all y in S. Okay, I can make this definition, there is nothing wrong with this definition. Right? It works. It works whether or not the dot product satisfies the norm condition, which is x dot x not being zero. Okay? This will definitely work. <coughs> There's no problem there. So that notation is for all. Okay? If you've not seen it before, it, it's short for for all. Okay? Y in S. Okay? So like you did before, you can show this S perp will also be a subspace. Okay? And you can in, on top of that show the dimension of S perp will be n minus m. All that will follow from basic linear algebra and Gaussian elimination. Okay, So, the inner product and its properties do not really play into this picture. Okay, So, all those things will follow from that. So, you can show 
S perp is in fact a subspace of dimension n minus these two you can show okay so the the crucial difference between subspaces in the binary vector space and subspaces in rn is in rn where will s and s perp intersect only in zero in, in the binary vector space s and s perp can intersect in a very non trivial fashion you can have a in fact you can have s equals s perp okay that is a very active research area in coding. How to find subspaces S in binary vector space so that S equals S perp. Okay. So, they call self dual codes if you have heard about them before. Okay. So, it is a it is an interesting thing to have. Okay. So, that is a difference in binary. Okay. The crucial difference from Rn is S intersect S perp can be non trivial okay just to uh, increase your curiosity in it i can tell you s equals s perp is possible okay <coughs> all right so any questions basic questions so this was a quick review I mainly pointed out the difference between what you can expect in binary and real num real vector spaces without going into any great detail of or proof or anything like that. Wherever I need, I will use additional facts. Okay, for instance, <coughs> from if I have a m dimensional subspace S and if I give you m linearly independent vectors, okay, you can do Gaussian elimination and reduce them to what form? To a row reduced echelon form, right? And you will get some kind of a canonical system, right? You will have this non overlapping form with this i n p type structure, okay? So, that is how we went to the systematic form. All that they will use, they will use whenever necessary, okay? And I will assume you are familiar with that, okay? It is no point in proving those things in a class in coding theory, okay? Any other question, curious point about this intersection? We will see an example soon enough. At that point, maybe this will be uh, clear, okay? Let us see, let us see an example. What n should I pick? What n do you like really? Which is your lucky number? Don't give me too large an n. Man. I am going to say 5. 5 is a good enough uh, number to pick. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, 5 is a little nasty as in you cannot have this uh, self-dual stuff. So, let me pick a different number. So, pick the closest number. 6. Okay, six. You can have some nice, nice uh, things. Okay. All right. So, so what's the? So, if I write down the all the vectors of the six-dimensional binary vector space, how many vectors will I get? Two plus six, which is sixty-four vectors. Okay. So, I'm going to define a subspace here, which is, let's say. Uh, okay, so here's more notation. Okay, so this is again notation which you should get comfortable with. If I say a subspace is this, let's say 100001, then 100010. Okay, suppose I say this, what does it mean? What's the most basis. obvious way of interpreting it? This is a basis. Well, I'm not going to say this is a basis, I'll say Span this is a spanning set. Okay, what do I mean by a spanning set? You have to take all linear combinations of these two vectors to get all the vectors from the subspace. Suppose I call this as u1 and suppose I call this as u2. Okay, how many vectors do I have? Two vectors in my spanning set. Okay, so how many linear combinations can I take? I can multiply u1 with some constant and then add it to, right? So this s actually is what a times u1 plus b times u2 what are a and b zero. yeah a and b are just 0 and 1 so you can't have so that will be a difference between these infinite vector spaces that you are used to and the finite vector space everything is finite okay the total number of vectors itself is only finite so you can't have 
this is infinite notion this is lines and planes going all over the place it's just it's all finite okay there's only a finite number of them <coughs> okay so if you do that there are only four possibilities for a and b and you can easily substitute that and get all the four vectors that you'll have in this subspace okay i'm not claiming u1 and u2 are linearly independent in this case are they linearly independent yeah you can easily see that they're linearly independent so it will also be a basis okay. in general i might give only a spanning set and you should be able to deal with that okay so if you do this you'll get first vector you'll always get is what all zeros and then these u's will repeat it's not a problem and then the non trivial vector you'll get will be 0 1 <coughs> okay is that fine okay good so <laughs> all right so that's uh, that's how we define the subspace okay <coughs> all right so that's fine so now if you if you go back to our generator matrix okay Okay. If you go back to our generator matrix, what did we have? We had the code, okay, the code, the code word C being M times G. Okay. And M was what? All possible k bit vectors, messages, k bit vectors, all possible k bit vectors is what we took. Okay. So now you see the connection between the way subspaces are defined and way you way you do this generator matrix. Okay. So if I have to write down the code itself, what is the code? Code is set of all right C equals M G and then you take M belonging to what? 0, 1, K. Okay, that is your code. Okay, set of all code words. Okay. So now, if I imagine G as having k rows and n columns, and suppose let's say these k rows are linearly independent. Okay, just just for now, I'll assume they are linearly independent. If they are not linearly independent, what will you do? You can do elimination and throw away the linearly dependent ones and get only the linearly independent ones. So I'll always say the, the rows in G are linearly independent. In the systematic form that we picked, IP, the rows are always linearly independent. Okay, so so for, so now we can always say they're linearly independent. I'll say I here, I K here, and then P here. Okay. So let's write down the this form in a different way. I'll say the first row is G1, second row is G2. Okay, and I'm simply writing it row by row. Okay, G2, so on till the kth row. Okay, suppose my generator matrix, the rows of my generator matrix are G1 through GK. Okay, so you see the connection is really clear. I'll I'll write it down in the next in the next page. So you see any code word C is actually M0 times G1 plus M1 times G2 plus so on till MK minus 1 times GK. Right? And these MIs are actually bits 0, 1. Okay, so what am I doing when I multiply my message with the generator matrix? I'm actually taking a linear combinations of linear combination of the rows of the generator matrix. Okay, and what is my code? The set of all possible linear combinations. So clearly the code is nothing but a subspace with spanning set equal to the rows of the generator matrix okay so that that clearly follows from here the code is subspace g g g1 right i'm sorry g1 g2 g k okay 
that is very clear. Even if G1 to GK happens to be linearly independent like in the case that we had before IP, then you know it is a basis also. Okay. So now you see there is an obvious generalization to the gener generator matrix. You no longer have to need it to be, be in the form IP. Okay. You can take any K vectors as the rows of the generator matrix. How will you reduce it to the IP form? You do Gaussian elimination. Okay. So this is actually the most general definition for a linear code. Well, linear binary code of course, but the way I defined it for instance, I defined actually a systematic encoder for a binary linear code. Okay, so if you take the books for instance, you will never see the binary linear code being defined in that fashion. Binary linear code will always be defined as a subspace of 0, 1, n. <coughs> okay, that is the way you have to think about it. Okay. All right. <coughs> now you notice one simple fact about the linear code which will be true. If you take any two code words and add them, what should you get? You should get another code word. Okay, I could have proved it starting with C equals mg. How will I prove it starting with C equals mg? Okay, take m1g, m2g and then add what will, what will happen? You will get m1 plus m2 into g. Okay, m1 plus m2 is another message. So, obviously m1 plus m2 into g will also be another code word. All that you can do with that definition. But the moment you say it is a subspace, you feel better, right? So, you have a nice abstract understanding of it. You say it is a subspace, you add any two code words, you should get another code word. So, all this seems, which just comes very naturally. Okay, so you see. That is the general definition and then uh, from here you again get that uh, sum of two code words is another code word. All these simple properties follow very nicely from it. Okay. Another advantage in having this nice vector space view is suppose somebody says somebody gives you a spanning set which is not in reduced form, okay. then using your ve vector space knowledge, you will know how to deal with it. right? Suppose I give you a generator matrix G, suppose I define a code with the generator matrix G which is not systematic, right? it is not already in that form. Okay. What is the advantage in having it in systematic form? You know how to build the encoder, you know how to write a program for the encoder, you know how to form the parity bit as a linear combination of the message bits. If I do not give you in that form, what happens? It is not in systematic form, but you can still write a program for the finding the code word. How will you do that? You take simply do m times g, right? Simply do the linear combinations, you will get that. Okay? There is not a lot of advantage to that. So, there is, <coughs> there is some advantage to repeating the message by itself, then only computing the parities as opposed to computing every bit of your code word. Okay? So, if you want that advantage in your encoder, you will have to do some some work. What is the work that you have to do? You have to do a Gaussian elimination, linearly do all the elimination, reduce it to this form. Okay? But what are you guaranteed when you do all that? What does not change? The set of code words or the code does not change. Why? You know from your elimination theory that all your Gaussian elimination does not change the row space of the matrix. Okay? So that is the advantage in having this vector space view. The moment you have this vector space view, you are not afraid of playing around with the code words of the code. You know, you can take all these linear combinations and as long as you do it properly and as long as you do not introduce any dependence or anything, your code will not change. Everything is fine and you have that comfort, extra degree of comfort. Okay? Is that clear? Okay, so that is the advantage of going to this abstract view. At one point, it might seem like totally unnecessary, but in practice, it helps in being able to play around with these code words and uh, come up with some simplified uh, cases. Okay, so I am going to stop here in the next class. We will take a general, take a few examples of generator matrices, play around with it, reduce to systematic form and then we will slowly move into the parity check matrix side. Okay. <coughs> yes. Any k vectors will, can span, can span a linear code, yes. A k dimensional linear code. What do you mean by uh, span? What do you mean by? I don't understand. See, every set of k will not give you the same set of code words. You will get the different code, but it is defined to be the code, no problem. 
you will get a different code if you change your set of vectors. Well, you could get a different code if you change it properly. Is that your question? What is your question? But it may not be a good code. I'm not saying it's a useful code. I'm not saying it's practical or you want to use it. It is a code. The definition is it's a code. 